well, it's great to have everyone with us today. We're going to have a, a wonderful show here with Mike Sharples. And I've been looking forward to this for a couple of weeks, not just because he's a precursor to the 4th of July and we have someone from Brit Britain coming in today, but we're <laughs> going to talk about learning on a massive scale. And we're going to talk about the past, the present, and the future, and indeed the future of Future Learn, where he was one of the kind of principles involved in, in the creation of that. But Mike, Mike's been doing much, much more than that. Uh, if you look at his career over time, he got started in computational creativity in the 1970s onto computers and writing. And he has this book, How We Write, Writing as Creative Design in the 1980s. And that's when I was a writing researcher. So I was probably reading some of the similar things. And that's why I bought many of his books and gave them away a few a couple of years ago. <laughs> Uh, we got into artificial intelligence, which in the 1990s and education, which today is alive and well, and he's probably going to tap back into that again in the 2000s into mobile learning. When I first got to know him a bit, when he was first in Birmingham and then Nottingham, he was at uh, Birmingham in educational technology and distance learning and later as in learning sciences and director of learning science research at the University of Nottingham and then uh, getting into innovative pedagogy at the Open U of the UK, which has an annual report uh, called Innovating Pedagogy. And Mike was involved in that, uh, kind of in charge of the report. And, and he still probably has his, dips his toe into that, or at least reads it. Uh, he's, I don't believe he's in charge of it anymore. In um, 2015, Mike wrote a chapter in my book, MOOCs 2030, A Future of Massive Online Learning with Rebecca Ferguson and Russell Beal. And so I've known about Mike's work for a, quite a number of years and his most recent book is Practical Pedagogy, 40 Ways to Teach and Learn, which gets into things like social learning, which he'll talk about, uh, but you have chapters here on, um, interdisciplinary crossover kinds of learning, a, a dynamic assessment, um, geo learning, navigating knowledge, interesting uh, citizen inquiry. And that citizen inquiry is <laughs> something we'll want to talk about today. So Mike, do you want to kind of, I've kind of fleshed out a little bit of decades, but do you want to peer into the decades and tell us a bit about yourself? Oh, okay, well, th thank you, Kurt, for that uh, expansive um, uh, introduction. Um, where do I start? So my background was originally in computing uh, and artificial intelligence. So I did a first degree in computer science and I went to the AI department at Edinburgh University um, because I was fascinated about how computers could help children, help children to develop their thinking skills. And the AI department at that point had uh, a unit called the Bionics Research Unit, which sounded very trendy. Um, it was essentially an education technology group. And so I joined that um, originally to do physics simulations for children, but the computers at that time weren't up to it. So I ended up working on a project for my PhD around children's development of writing abilities. So developing computer tools to help children um, develop their language and thinking and writing skills. Um, I had many other projects since then. Um, what I've tended to do is work with some of the leading experts uh, in the field. So I worked with one of the leading experts in neuroradiology, developing a tutoring system for radiology. Uh, I was funded for a time by Kodak. And so I worked with Kodak on a project uh, around children as photographers. Um, but as Kurt said, my more recent projects were around mobile learning. Back in the early 2000s, um, we developed what's probably the first um, demonstration of a smartphone, which was in 1999. We cobbled together a tablet computer, one of the very early Kodak uh, digital cameras, uh, a cell phone card, uh, and we had some talented students who put it all together uh, into a, a package as a mobile learning device for children. And that led to the work we did on mobile learning. And then uh, I came to the Open University, and the Open University is a fascinating place. I don't know how much you know about it um, in the US, but it's the biggest university in the UK. 
uh, one of the biggest in Europe. Uh, and its two main things are, apart from its size, are uh, that it teaches by distance learning, but it's a research-led university, so it's high quality teaching and it's open access. So you don't have to have any qualifications to study for most degrees at the Open University. So it was a fascinating project. It's just celebrated its 50th anniversary and it's still expanding. And the Open University uh, in 2012 uh, set up the FutureLearn MOOC platform. And I was asked by the Vice Chancellor of the Open University to lead a team to work with the software developers at FutureLearn to try and explore how we could do something of the power and innovation of the Open University, but do it in a MOOC space. And that's how I got into MOOCs and learning at scale. And then the more recent project with the BBC called Inquire around doing inquiry learning at scale. So that's a kind of potted history of my background, which has been very varied. And I've been so privileged to work with some real experts in the field uh, and working with them on designing platforms to support learning. What you didn't talk about there was innovative, innovating pedagogy report, yeah. the annual report. A um, couple of things there. Uh, your career has been both developing technologies, but also testing new pedagogies. Yeah. So you're at the intersection of pedagogy and technology in effect, right? But it's absolutely, like, yeah. Seems so like the pedagogy side has been emphasized more and more in, you know, as your career's progressed. Can yeah. you talk about the report and who, who the audience is and what mm -hmm. the goals were and if you've met your goals or exceeded your goals or, and so forth, what, what can people get if they download the report? What can they expect to read about um, and, and who's it intended for? Okay, well, back in 2012, um, MOOCs were just setting up and it was clear that there was a growing interest in um, not just the technology, but the teaching and learning. And we'd, uh, we knew about the Horizon reports, uh, which were still are successful annual reports, but they were very much focused on the technology. So how technology can support education which is fine, but we wanted to do something similar, but with a focus on the other side, a focus on the pedagogy. And in fact, we debated for a long time what we should call it, because at that time, the P word pedagogy, there were a lot of different interpretations of it, and we weren't sure whether it would resonate with people, but we decided to take the plunge and call it innovating pedagogy. And so the aim was for each report to um, initially amongst ourselves, but then with partners, to just brainstorm amongst ourselves what were the emerging methods of teaching, learning, and assessment. So by pedagogy, we mean the theory and practice of teaching, learning, and assessment. So each year, we got together in an informal group um, in the good old days, face-to-face, -face, now online, um, to brainstorm what are the 10 emerging trends in um, pedagogy. And then we had a fun time uh, writing abstracts and then fleshing those out into a report. And each year it seems to, you know, each year we say we can't think of any more. Uh, you know, we've done enough. And then we find that actually there are more. There are more fascinating ones coming along. And so we've now run the report with partners from Beijing, um, from SRI International, uh, partners from Dublin, from Israel. So we've done each report in partnership and it's ha had around 300,000 downloads. So we've been really pleased with the reception and it's had influence. Um, a few years back, I went to Spain and met the deputy education minister in Spain who said, oh yes, of course I know innovating pedagogy. It's been really influential in Spain. Um, so it's, it's just good that we were able to shift the balance a bit. So it's not that I'm against technology, far from it. I mean, my background is in technology, but it's about the balance between the pedagogy and the technology. And that's been my career, trying to get that balance, trying to use innovating uh, innovations in pedagogy alongside new and emerging technologies. 
So we have the Horizon people coming in in two weeks, or people who wrote the insert for the latest Horizon report, okay. the people from three different countries. So um, that will be this is a good uh, precursor to that. And 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 did did those annual reports end up becoming this book? Is that you know uh, is that what led to this book? So yes and no. Um, so after what eight years of um, the report. Um, I, it was a personal project, the book. Um, I wanted to try and reach a new audience. So we had lots of downloads, but they were mainly academics uh, and practitioners and policy makers. What uh, I wanted to try and do was to reach teachers, uh, school teachers. And so I took the best 40, added one or two uh, myself actually to make 40 and try to revise and extend each one of them. So each, I didn't just take them straight out of the reports, each one of them was revised and extended, aimed specifically at school teachers um, and um, trying to inspire them um, to think different, um, to see how they could, um, and I wanted to use some practical examples from around the world. And it was great to take examples from India, um, from um, uh, Latin America, from Chile, and from other places, um, to show how those pedagogies were being really enacted, really um, done in practice by teachers in their classrooms. And most of them didn't need high tech. That was the great thing. Uh, all of the 40, I think, could be done without technology. Um, and I was you know, pleased by, yes, you could, use technology uh, to run them, but also you could do almost all of them without technology uh, in a classroom or outdoors. I know Chris is gonna jump in there. Yes, Chris, yes, you can. Um, we've got this book right here, 2019. Any teachers watching the video um, in the uh, archive? Uh, it, it came out just before the pandemic. So it's perfect mm, timing. It's exactly. Rut Rutledge is the publisher. So if anyone wants to pick that up. Uh, well, Chris, thank you, you for the advert. <laughs> Well, it's time for a new version, post-pandemic version, right? So. Uh, yes, I mean, I've been doing work with UNESCO and UNICEF, um, and just everything seems to be changing, but also everything stays the same. So it's changing in that you know, schools, universities had to react. All this planning that they've done for years and years about how they might go online, suddenly in two weeks, they had to do it. Um, so in that sense, it all changed. But the pedagogies, um, you know, those are, um, you know, they haven't changed. The ways that we learn, the ways that we teach haven't changed. And so I think I, if I was re rewriting it now, post pandemic, there would be much more emphasis on how to make it work, how to make those pedagogies work, work online, work in the classroom. But the pedagogies themselves are still just as valid as they were. So I um, am responsible for some of those downloads because ah. I have assigned innovating pedagogy and as a reading in some of my courses. Thank you. Um, and and mm. well, thank you because you're right that a lot of the reports are more technological and and technology is a catalyst. It's not an innovation in and of itself. But I'd like to talk about uh, future learn. Um, there are a lot of headlines in the U.S. over the last week because MIT and Harvard combined to sell edX yeah. for $800 million. And um, so all of the conversation about MOOCs had sort of revived, at least temporarily. Um, I uh, am not a fan of, of things like edX because of the andragogy that's involved. It's uh, very teaching by telling and learning by listening. And, and in a way kind of ignored a hundred years of insights from distance education when those traditional MOOCs came out. But, but Future Learn, which came out at about the same time was more thoughtful about instructional design. And so I'd love to hear you talk about um, not just that time, but how you see massive learning having evolved over the last 10 years or so. Okay. Um, 
Well, I'll have to take you back to the end of 2012. And 2012, I think it was the New York Times that called it the year of the MOOC. Um, so it was, there was MOOC mania at the time. Um, and that was all coming from the US. So edX and Coursera um, were already established. And here we were at the Open University, you know, priding ourselves on distance learning, the Open University, which uh, the government had set up um, in 1969, and we weren't doing MOOCs. So the government education, higher education minister went to Stanford and he came back and he barely got off the plane. Then he contacted the um, vice chancellor of the Open University and said, this MOOC thing, you know, why aren't we doing it? And the vice chancellor said, well, we, we're doing, we've got our open learn platform, we do open learning. No, 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 you're not doing it like the Americans. So the vice chancellor took up the, the challenge and to his credit, he set up a separate operation. The Open University has got lots of strengths, but moving past isn't one of them. So he set up a separate operation um, uh, called Future Learn and uh, got together a team um, within two or three weeks, uh, which again would have taken six months at the Open University, um, to design a platform, design a new platform. And he also asked me to lead a team from the Open University to design the pedagogy. So here was a huge opportunity. You know, I'd been designing um, uh, technology for use in classrooms for 30 kids. And suddenly there was this carte blanche to design a new platform uh, from scratch with backing of the Open University for hundreds of thousands of people. So we kind of had to put our technology um, uh, where our mouths were. Um, and so we knew that we weren't going to copy edX and Coursera, that we weren't going to copy that notion of uh, the, uh, the lecture online plus quizzes uh, and assignments. So we wanted to start from a pedagogy. So we talked with the team at Future Learn about what sorts of underlying learning theories um, might drive Future Learn. And we talked about social cultural approaches or mastery learning. Um, but the only one they really got was learning as conversation. Now, I don't know how much you know about learning as conversation. You've, you had the session with Diana Lorillard, but it's a, it comes from a different foundation, from a foundation of cybernetics, um, from Gordon Pask originally, uh, and then uh, reinterpreted by Diana Lorelei. And the idea is that all learning is a conversation. We converse with ourselves as we try to understand the topic. We converse with each other as we try to reach some mutual understanding. We converse with teachers um, as we try to understand what they're saying to us and report that back. So all, you know, all learning is a conversation. And what you can do with technology is to support those different sorts of conversations. So you've got conversations at the level of actions about things that you're doing. So it might be watching a video or doing an experiment and it's conversations about how and what. But there's conversations at the level of descriptions about why, what's the purpose of what you're doing. And the idea is to design a platform that supports those different kinds of conversations. And that was the fundamental proposition of Future Learn, that we would design a platform that would support those different sorts of conversations. So we drew the conversations on the board and little lines between learners and teachers. And how do we design a platform around those different types of conversation? And one of the earliest decisions was that you don't have conversations that are separate from the learning. So you don't watch a video and then go off to a forum in some separate area the conversations must be tightly bound to what it is that you're doing, those conversations for action, so that every piece of learning would have a conversation attached to it. And that was a quite a challenge. We thought, you know, so ev every video, every piece of text, um, every simulation would have an attached conversation. And we wanted it to be about what they were doing. So um, conversations for action. And then also to have a different type of conversation, which was more reflective about why it is. So being able to synthesize your knowledge and share that with others. We kind of thought those conversations bound to the content, there might be seven or eight, you know, probably 10 contributions. 
the biggest um, MOOC course we ran was with the British Council um, uh, training for the IELTS exam, which had, I think it was 220,000 um, uh, people who registered for the course. And just the first video had 65,000 comments and replies. So we realized we had this huge scale of conversation, which was exciting, but we have no idea how to manage it. So we had to bring in techniques from social media, and that's a long story, but we, we had this kind of abundance of riches, which is that um, we, the conversations worked. The other thing we thought was that it might be like YouTube, so that the conversations would be abusive, um, that they would be flaming, and that just didn't happen. Um, it may be because the first alpha testers were from the Open University, and the Open University is lots of nice people, but for some reason, um, even with the more controversial courses, the conversations have been almost entirely constructive. Um, and if you want to do a comparison, we did do a comparison with the other platforms. The biggest difference between the other platforms was the level of social engagement. Um, it was about 30% of the students who uh, contributed, and many more of them were vicarious learners, but about 30 30 percent of them actually contributed to the conversations. It wasn't compulsory, but it was part of the learning. I think uh, Chris, my, is Chris's mic still on? I know Punya has a follow-up. Um, so um, if I can, Mike, this, I mean, you actually led right to that because I was sort of curious because one of the challenges uh, with the conversational models, particularly at scale, is going to be, uh, if not sort of flame wars breaking out, but just this just the, the scale of it. And I should uh, start actually from like what a fan I am of the open university model um, because I've worked with the open university in India, the Indira Gandhi National Open University. I have some good friends there. In fact, one of our early mm -hmm. uh, earliest guests was somebody who had formerly worked there. Mm -hmm. And I'm always like, and I remember reading this somewhere that Howard Wilson said that this was his greatest achievement as prime minister was the setting up of the open university. So I think that for a politician to say something about education, which is not absolutely stupid, you know, I think that's why it stayed with me. Um, but that said, I mean, uh, coming to the scale issue and I mean, because yes, you know, all learning is conversational as you described it. How did you think about this sort of, sort of managing the scale of this discussion? Because, you know, if I make a comment and then by the time somebody responds mm -hmm. to it, it's you know three screenshots down, right? Three windows down. Uh, and secondly, what's the role of sort of the instructor in that space? Um, you know, many of the MOOC models is you know it's it's there. You go do whatever you need to do, and at the end of it, you are done. And so, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I have a couple of more questions. But let's stick with this. Is like how do you manage the scale of it, and what's the role of the instructor in that space? Because you know when we think about traditional learning, um, or even in progressive mm -hmm. sort of modes of learning, mm -hmm. the instructor has an important role, whether you call them guide on the side, or you call them a mentor, or whatever you call them. Mm -hmm. But at this scale, how does that work? Okay, those are both really good questions. Um, so firstly, we wanted to have two different sorts of conversation. So we wanted to have the conversations associated with the content, which were conversations at the level of actions. And we wanted to make it as simple as possible to contribute. So we decided very early on that we didn't have, wanted to have multiple threaded discussions. We wanted to have what we call a water cooler discussion, so a rolling discussion. We weren't too concerned about whether there was repetition. What um, we wanted was for uh, the learners to see what was scrolling up and then um, to join in that. One of the things we discovered early on was that um, if you just asked um, the students, oh, what do you think about this? They won't respond. You have to, so what was so important we discovered was the nature of the question. Um, and particularly asking a question that asks the students to draw on their own experience. So I remember one of the early courses I did was called The Secret Power of Brands, which was about brands and branding. And I found it fascinating. It was from the University of Reading. Uh, and um, one of the questions was, what does a brand mean to you? And what are the popular brands in your country? Uh, and 
anybody could answer that. Anybody could say what were the popular brands and then what did those brands, so you know, in India, for example, you know, what were the most popular brands in India? And got onto some fascinating conversations about no brand brands, for example, like Muji and what is a no brand brand. And so as this rolled on, you, um, the first thing, you, know, you could contribute whenever you wanted. It was a rolling discussion. But also we then started to use techniques from social media like um, liking and following. So you could search for the most liked um, con uh, contribution. Um, uh, and then the role of the facilitator or the educator um, was, one of them was to, we provided them with dashboards so that they could pick up on the most liked. Um, we could pick up on um, ones from people who were frequent contributors because we had um, people who were frequent contributors across future learn courses. So we encouraged those educators to zone in on um, most liked comments, ones from frequent con contributors, or just to scroll down and found ones that they found provocative and then um, to um, contribute themselves. And we also encourage the students to follow the educators. So once um, you know, the educator made a comment, then the students were alerted that somebody they followed had made a comment. They then clustered to that, it became most liked and so on. It was like a kind of magnet that attracted. But what we didn't want to do was the educator to lead the discussion. We want the educator to pick up on the emerging discussions. So that took a bit of time to kind of set in, but it, it did work. Um, and then the other kind of discussions were the more reflective ones where you had, uh, in future then they call steps. So we had a discussion step as well, where you're expected to reflect on what you've done during that week and to synthesize your understanding. And usually there'd be less contributors there um, but there would be more depth and more detail to those discussions. So that's how we, we ran it. We wanted to have very easy entry to the discussions and then this rolling discussion. One of the things was very early on, the students were complaining that they couldn't read all the comments. And we kind of had to say to them, it doesn't matter. You know, it, it, you, know you won't hear all the comments at a water cooler, at a conference. You won't hear all the conference, you know, all the comments that people make outside the um, the conference contributions. It doesn't matter, um, but if you can just pick up on what's currently happening, that's enough. That will help you. So, Mike, okay, we thank have you. That about three questions in a row coming. We have first one with Punya related, I think, to AI, maybe something else. Then we'll go mm -hmm. to Chris and talk about Enquire, and then we'll come back to me and bring up an audience question slash my question back to pedagogy. So, Punya well, first. Okay. So, yeah, uh, I, I will leave the AI one for later if we have time. I wanted to just ask a follow up, you know, which is the example that you gave of this class, you know, about the brands and so on. Mm -hmm. So, one of, you know, my line of work, which I, you know, have sort of moved on from that, but was always around this intersection between technology and pedagogy, which we have talked about, but the important role that the nature of the content itself plays, because learning, you know, uh, uh, something around branding or communication is different from, let's say, if you're learning mathematics and so, or physics or geology or, mm -hmm. or music or whatever it may be, mm -hmm. right? Different content uh, mm -hmm. requires different forms of representation, different forms of, yeah. you know, uh, engaging with the world. So I'm wondering if that sort of, did that play a role in your discussions and in your design of the systems, um, you know, as you're, yes. talk, you know, as you're describing them? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I have said that all learning involves conversation, but also there are, you know, there are differences between subject areas. So if you're studying en you know, engineering or theoretical physics, it's going to be different to if you are studying a course on ancient Rome. In fact, a course on ancient Rome and future learn was fascinating because they had a model of ancient Rome that you could interact with and then share your experience with. But so, Different subject areas are going to have different types of um, types of learning, and we certainly it wasn't the intention that all learning should be um, conversation heavy. So, um, we uh, another of the design decisions were to design around what we call steps, which were kind of um, educational Lego bricks that you could put together. So you assembled these Lego bricks, 
um, into uh, a, um, a week of learning. Each Lego brick was 20 minutes um, of learning. And again, just about everything in Future Learn has a, has a reason behind it. Um, and you know, we looked at what would be a good length of, of learning. So we have these pe pedagogic Lego bricks. Um, and for more science oriented topics, they would tend to be um, more around mastery learning. So you would have a video, uh, you would have then some uh, uh, online questioning, um, educator led online questioning. Uh, then you might have a discussion about it, then another piece of content. Um, one of the decisions was very much about what the content prompted you to do. So we had we worked very closely with the early course designers on making sure each piece of content led to an action. It wasn't just watch this video, but what are you expected to do as a result of watching that video? Um, was it to answer a question? Um, was it to do a, a summary? Was it to have a discussion? And that very much came out from the Open University. I mean, that was one of the OU's methods of teaching that every piece of content should lead to an action. Thank you. Um, I know there's a lot more questions there <laughs> I could go on, but let's, let's pass the baton. Uh, Kurt, who's next? Yeah, I, I remember that Lego notion when I visited your offices in 2014. And I think you were in the British Library or connected. Yeah, to it? that's right. We were very privileged to have offices um, behind the scenes in the British Library, which was a just wonderful place to work. Chris, you want to jump in here? Yes, uh, I know that you've moved on from Future Learn and are doing Enquire now. And as someone whose historic background is in science education, of course, inquiry is a very powerful method of learning, but we don't often see it done at scale. So I'm fascinated to hear about uh, your instructional designs for inquire. Okay, <clears throat> so with inquire, we had two aims. One was to try and bring together citizen science and inquiry learning. So we know that citizen science works uh, it you know, works as a, uh, a science for and with the people, um, but most citizen science projects aren't designed to support learning. Learning could be a byproduct from the citizen science. You could you know, learn more about astronomy, for example, from classifying galaxies, but it's not primarily designed for, uh, for learning. So, and then you've got inquiry learning going right back to Dewey, um, which is a learning um, from inquiry investigating in depth into a topic. So we wanted to try and merge those two. We also wanted to try and do it at scale. Um, and so that was the, the background behind inquire. Um, we had a couple of earlier platforms where we did manage successfully to merge inquiry learning and citizen science. So taking uh, originally school students, but then adults through an entire inquiry circle um, and in a later platform, allowing um, anybody, individuals or communities to set up their own investigations. And they were then supported in running those investigations. So it kind of flips uh, citizen science. So instead of citizens in citizen science, it's the scientists who set up the investigation and the members of the public who then contribute in what we call citizen inquiry. It's members of the public uh, or community groups that set up the investigation and scientists help with running those investigations. Then we wanted to do it at scale and we were really fortunate to have a partnership with the BBC. And the BBC had been running something called Lab UK for a number of years, which was um, doing large scale investigations. So off the back of TV programs, they would do a survey or they would go out and ask people to um, spot birds or you know, do those sorts of large scale investigations, but they didn't have a single platform for doing it. So they asked us to develop that platform with them. And so it was a huge opportunity because we knew that the BBC could deliver an audience at scale. Um, 
And so we built a platform called Enquire, which is still there, www.enquire.org.uk. Um, and the most successful one was um, with BBC Garden Watch. So every year, and the BBC um, prime time has a week long um, uh, study of nature called Spring Watch. Uh, and they have cameras set up um, to watch birds, fledglings hatch. And as part of this, they wanted to do an investigation of British gardens. So Britain, great gardening nation, but nobody had ever surveyed British gardens. But there's more um, land in British gardens than there are in all the national parks put together. So the BBC decided to run a survey called Garden Watch, and they used our platform. Uh, and so every day on primetime television, they promoted and publicized this Garden Watch where you went to your own garden and you were asked to survey your garden to say what's in it, but also to look for the animals, the birds, the uh, flora in your garden and to record it uh, and then to send that back. And then it was promoted and there were discussions around it. So it was a huge opportunity. And we had 280,000 contributions. Um, and at the, after the first TV program, we were having 10,000 registrations a second onto the platform. So it was just amazing. Uh, and of course the platform crashed, but only for a few minutes. And after that, it all, it all went smoothly. So it was just an amazing experience that. And so we've been able to um, both run this platform, um, but also to explore different sorts of what we call citizen inquiry. So you can either run survey type inquiries um, and set them up yourself. So anyone, it, it's free for anyone to set up an investigation. So you can run survey type inquiries, but with multimedia, with a uh, built-in consent forms, or you can run open discussion type, um, conversational type inquiries, where all the data is open for you to discuss. So that's the platform, Inquire, uh, and it's there. It's ready for anybody who wants to run an investigation, a citizen investigation at scale. Well, I was going to ask to, for you to give an example, but you gave one about mm, the garden watch. Yeah, yeah, I mean that was just such a. I, I mean, if you if you've spent your life designing technology for thirty kids in a classroom, suddenly there are two hundred and eighty thousand people. Um, it's just an amazing experience, and ten thousand a second who are registering. It was it, it was just wild. And, and, and the number of people who downloaded the Innovating Pedagogy report, like, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of people? And, and yeah, 300,000. Yeah, 300,000. And you got, you got 280,000 here. And you're talking, big, and, and the people using the MOOC, uh, mm. the future learn. I mean, you've had an impact. Any of us would be happy with one of those. But you've, been, <laughs> you've had three, six, sort of, I'll call it successes, impactful projects in a row. And so that's got to, in some ways, it's got to feel kind of reinvigorating, uh, even though you've taken, you know, you're on your own now, you're no longer affiliated with Open U of the UK. Um, you know, wh how does that feel to have, to have had those successes all re run in a row? Um, I mean, it feels good. I mean, because I suppose until then, it had always been, yeah, you know, we're doing good stuff, but who knows about it? It gets published in an academic paper and you know it influences over time the work we've done on mobile learning it had had some influence over time but i kind of knew that education technology could be done at scale it couldn't be done within a formal setting um, or at least it couldn't be done easily within a formal setting so we had to take it into an informal environment and that was either citizen science or into MOOCs uh, into informal learning. One of the things I would love to do and still haven't done is to try and do that learning at scale with younger people. Um, and I think there's a huge opportunity, um, at, you know, especially as, we, you know, through the pandemic, it would have been great to engage younger people uh, in those, that sort of inquiry learning, the kind of things we did with Future Learn or Inquire with younger people at scale. And I think there's still an opportunity, you know, those of you out there, um, great designers to do that. I think you and Chris should talk more because this is his area, is, 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 is bailiwick. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, we have an audience question. 
And it's not just an audience question, it's a special audience question, because my, from my dear friend Dor Dorit Marr from Perth, uh, and also from Israel, uh, she's asking a question about, um, and hi to Dorit, mm -hmm. I think she's taking early retirement, um, so like you, uh, what makes the pedagogies innovative? And I have mm -hmm. a follow-up, because my, I have another, my, one of my questions I wrote down was, um, what is your what are your favorite in the 40 pedagogies you talk about in the book what are your favorite ones and and i and this is again practical pedagogy so the follow-up book could be called impractical pedagogy uh, <laughs> i'm so going to have to question. get my book if you hold yeah. on a second <laughs> you a copy. so he's gonna have to remember what he wrote okay. uh, there we are okay. <laughs> <laughs> i can't remember all 40. So um, Dort's Dor asking what makes pedagogies yeah. innovative and I ask, I'm asking you what, what's your favorites in, okay. within that? So yeah I've had it's a good question and it's one that I've had before of you know what's so innovative. Um, I think some of them are genuinely um, you know the pedagogy themselves are, are innovative. Um, so um, for example ones like um, uh, uh, translanguaging um, which you know, I guess, you know, how many of you have heard of translanguaging? So, so translanguaging is um, teaching that encourages the students to express in their native language. And particularly if you've got you know, a mixed cultural group, rather than uh, assuming that everybody's going to speak English, you foster and you encourage uh, the students to do research in their native language, perhaps to discuss amongst themselves in their native language, and to uh, and to share those language resources, that richness of their language resource amongst each other. So, I mean, that's that's one example. Um, there are um, uh, some other ones. So, rhizomatic learning. Um, so, rhizomatic learning is the idea of. Um, you create learning communities through the interconnections of the learners. Um, and really, you can only do this in an online environment, um, or at least you can only do it in a, a fast and expressive way in an online environment. So you encourage that entanglement of connections and you find ways for people to entangle their, their connections and then let that rise up into shared knowledge. So I think some of them are genuinely innovative. Other ones, I, all of them, I interpreted in a modern way, particularly with technology. So you know, if you take something like um, oh, bricolage, um, so tinkering creatively with resources. Um, so bricolage has been around for a long time. I mean, it's been around since um, you know, historic times, but you know, that uh, if you were making a clay pot, you were doing bricolage, you were tinkering with resources. Um, but the opportunities to do that online, um, to be able to take a rich environment, um, such um, uh, as a, you know, an online simulation, uh, an online virtual world, and then to be able to tinker with those virtual resources within that online world, um, so you can, reinterpret many of those pedagogies in a new and different way and that's what I that's what I tried to do. Um, in terms of my favorite, one of them because I came from a background of cybernetics, uh, Gordon Pask who was one of my heroes, he was also he gave me some invaluable advice on my PhD. He turned up at the AI department in Edinburgh um, when I was just starting and this strange little man who looked like he he looked like a kind of wizard um, from Lord of the Rings, uh, came up and looked over my shoulder and asked me what I was doing. Uh, and I was explaining that I was developing this software for children. And he said, can I have a play? And he played with it and gave me the most invaluable advice I've had for my PhD. So I'm a great fan of Gordon Pask. But one of the concepts he developed was called Teachback. Uh, and the idea of teach back is that um, the instructor or the educator um, gives a, uh, an introduction to a concept and then asks the student, one or more students, to teach it 
back to the educator to reinterpret it. Now you can do that one-to-one. -one. It's done, for instance, between often between a doctor and a patient. It's been done in healthcare. So you're explaining to a patient about how to take medication. And then you ask the patient to explain back to you so that you're sure they understand it. And it's part of that notion of feedback, of learning through a feedback loop and reaching a shared understanding. Um, but you can do it between peers. So one peer tries to explain a topic, the other peer then teaches it back, or it can be done as a whole class activity. And I think understanding where that comes from of that notion of re reciprocal learning, learning as cybernetics, um, constructive feedback, but then looking at different ways of doing it. I had a PhD student who um, did it with uh, an automated voice response. Um, so getting one person to be supported by a, a voice recognition, uh, supported in their understanding, feeding back to the other person. So there are many different ways to do teach back and that's probably my favorite. And it also works. Uh, it's a really good way of understanding because you have to express your understanding back to somebody else. And in doing that, you have to reinterpret it and re-understand it. Yeah, Don Vance oh, yes. versus Christian University had a method called cooperative teaching scripts, yeah. cooperative learning scripts. And uh, I was my, one of my qualifying exam questions was related to cooperative learning, uh, uh, cooperative reading techniques. And uh, yeah. so I was reading and reciprocal teaching is involves yeah. some of that as well. Yeah. Not quite the same thing, but they're, they're in a the reading camp they come from. And so, uh, yeah. Um, uh, we should probably go to Punya's AI question before we forget. Uh, Punya, you want to jump in on AI? Sure. Uh, but before we uh, go to the AI thing, I just wanted to add something to the bricolage thing that uh, mm -hmm. you talked about. Um, I don't know if you know this person called Arvind Gupta. He is um, an educator out in India. And what he does, he makes toys, educational toys, out of crap, like junk, like scrap. Mm -hmm. And there is this whole uh, sort of philosophy called Kabard Se Jugard, which basically means creativity from trash. Mm. And they use everyday materials and build scientific experiments. It's an amazing line mm. of work. And again, goes back to a point I think you had made earlier, mm. which is that these pedagogical techniques, yes, they can be enhanced by the technology bric bricolage in the digital world, where you can mix and match different media, manipulate is, you know, is a very powerful tool, which we see kids today doing sort of naturally on TikTok or whatever, uh, Instagram all the time, but that there is a physical sort of component to it, which doesn't really need uh, that technology, but what it needs is a mindset of looking at the world for opportunities to put things together and take them apart, right? Uh, so that's a comment there, but I Absolutely. think the question I really, oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I was just I was agreeing with you. I think, um, there are so many resources to hand. I mean, physical, physically mm -hmm. to hand. You know, I'm just looking around my desk. There are so many resources that you can put together in new ways, um, mm -hmm. either physically construct it or use to to think in a different way. You know, I've got a whole set of um, notes here which I could um, distribute. I could write on. Um, I've got um, oh, you know, lots of different things pens what you know, just surrounding me Great. Um, that you can you can use to to construct an idea but also expansively to think mm -hmm. you know, how could I think about this problem in a different way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how can I construct something oh, uh, and it relates to rapid prototyping as well how Great. can I do that rapid prototyping um, out of things that are just ready to hand and I'm yeah, always so, in awe of people who are, who are designers who can do that. Right. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, quotes when I was to direct the master's program when I was at Michigan State was, like, we don't, you don't know what you know until you build something. And the mm -hmm. something could be a theory, could be a poem, could be an actual physical thing. But it's the act of constructing, of sharing that with others, getting feedback, that's the real learning uh, happening. But I want to come back to this question on AI. Um, so, I mean, that was mentioned that that's something that you have worked on. And I'm just wondering in these uh, things at scale that you're doing, where you have whatever the numbers were with the BBC project and so on, do you see, what do you see as sort of the role of AI or machine learning as possibly playing into that, that space? Okay, uh, I mean, I think that's complicated. Um, I mean, firstly, there are two different 
types of AI. There is the machine learning, data processing, neural network type of AI, which is about processing large amounts of data at scale uh, and being able to extract understanding from that. And then there is the other sort of symbolic AI, um, which is about developing representations of the mind or representations of teaching and learning. For the at scale, I mean, most of the uses so far have been around administration uh, and um, particularly when you've got large scale. So FutureLearn um, did a, a huge amount of interpretation of data at scale, being able to make predictions um, and to support business processes around that. Um, I think you can make use of AI around predictive analytics. Um, so predictive analytics is being able to predict a student's process, uh, progress. And at the OU, we had a, have a project around predictive analytics where within the first 10 days to two weeks, we can fairly accurately predict whether the student is going to succeed or fail in the course. Uh, but not only that, about how they will succeed or fail, what they will do good at, what they will do bad at. So we can do it. Um, and we've shown that we can do it. But then the question is, what use do you make of it? Um, so the last thing you want to do is to tell the student they're going to fail. <laughs> so <clears throat> then, um, so one use of it is feedback to the tutors to say this student is in danger of failing, they need extra support. Uh, and that's one thing we've looked at. But the other is the feedback to the student to say, um, other students like you um, in your you know, position are doing this and they are succeeding. Ones who've progressed a bit further with the course are doing this, uh, reading this resource and um, taking this quiz. So I think you can use predictive analytics and AI um, to help students to be able to get back on track and to offer them resources to help them succeed. And it's got to be done in a very careful way because as I say, the last thing you want to do is to discourage the student to tell them that they're failure, but you want to support them um, towards um, getting onto a track that's likely to be successful. So I think there are some uses of AI uh, at scale for doing that. And we've explored just that at the Open University because one of the great things we've got is that we've got thousands of students on our yeah. traditional OU courses. All of our courses are very carefully designed um, around specific pedagogies and specific combinations of teaching and learning components. And we've got a lot of data on outcomes on uh, whether students succeed or fail, what their exam score is, what their, um, uh, what their response is, so uh, their feedback on the course. And so we can start to match um, what types of course design support what types of outcomes. Uh, and um, there's been a group at the Open University, um, Bart Leantes, uh, a professor in learning analytics at the OU, has been doing some superb work on matching uh, learning design to learning outcomes. Mm -hmm. uh, and to cut a long story short, one of the things he found was that what students like best in terms of students' experience is courses with a lot of content. They like lots of lectures, lots of videos, um, and what they like least is talking with other students. But in terms of the outcomes, what they yes. do best at is courses yes. that have a lot of conversations with other students. Right. So right. Um, there is a complete mismatch between what mm -hmm. students say they like and what's best for them. And we've got to really try and square that circle. Uh, and one of the things we're now doing is saying to the students, Look, you may not like talking with other students, you may not like doing group work, but it's good for you. Uh, right. And how you get that across. And that came out of doing this large scale analytics. Right. So, I mean, this reminds me, there is actually some research to show, uh, in, even in regular classrooms, people who do project based learning or, you know, more open ended assignments, students claim that they learned less from it mm -hmm. than, you know, a more lecture based or traditional mode. But yeah. actually, the data doesn't support that. And I think that's kind of interesting. And one last point, not to make a plug for my university, but at Arizona State, one of the things that we have used learning analytics to really fine tune to the point of that students who on miss classes on these particular weeks, 
down the road in, you know, in some critical courses. And mm -hmm. so there has been a very targeted sort of approach towards student success, uh, mm -hmm. which has actually paid off uh, dividends um, exactly along the lines that you said. But I'm sensitive to the time. Kurt, I know you had a question, so pass it on yes. to you. And now that my good friend Sanjay Mishra, who used to work at Indira Gandhi Open University has asked the question. Sanjay, I'm gonna hold off your question. I need to ask John's question. John Hefferman in Ireland has asked us a question that's similar to my final question. So he asks, where is the MOOC going to go mm -hmm. in the post pandemic world? I think 2020, 2021 has broken the ice on a lot of technologies for the mainstream. My question is similar, and that is, what is the future of pedagogy and technology? I want you to put on your Nostradamus ha hat. You don't have the hair, but um, or the <laughs> beard or the beard of Nostradamus, but for a second, you know, we've talked about the past and where you've come from. We've talked about the present and how you're make, making a huge impact with Inquire and, 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 and mm. Future Learn. But what do you see for the future? Uh, cool. as, you know, what, can, tell us about <clears throat> Well, I'm almost certain to be wrong. Um, of course. But, and so don't quote me in 20 years time. Um, so, I mean, the first thing is that MOOCs are on a journey. Um, MOOCs now are very different to what they were in 2012. Um, not least because you've got some big takeovers and so on. But I think MOOCs are on a journey away from uh, informal leisure learning at scale towards um, targeted, targeted courses for professional development. Um, so I think there is going to be innovation around that, um, particularly um, with um, high quality universities working with MOOC platforms to have um, much more targeted professional development courses for um, digital education, um, <clears throat> for career retraining. And post pandemic, there's going to be a huge need um, both for people to retrain, but also to move into new industries, into green industries, for example, green technology, uh, into the digital industries. So I think MOOC platforms are going to reconfigure around um, that kind of digital training. There may be introductory large scale courses um, for, for where you get an introduction to say AI or introduction to blockchain technology, but then um, you have more focused courses to help you retrain. So I think that's one area that's going to come. I think the second area is at school education, which is that schools are going to have to be more resilient. Um, and the whole school system is going to have to be more resilient. You know, this isn't the last pandemic. It isn't the last emergency. Um, and schools uh, and you know, K-12 education knows that it may have to swap to online learning very rapidly. But also that online learning has its benefits. Um, and so a, a hybrid pedagogy where we take what's successful and effective in online learning which is networking, uh, which is being able to you know, access a range of resources, uh, which is to, for the students to be able to work in their own time, and what works best in the classroom, which is around teacher support, uh, which is around working intensively with a small group, which is around that bricolage you were talking about with physical objects, lab work. So a hybrid um, learning, where we recognize what works best online and what works best in the classroom and how you can merge and mesh the two. Um, and I think the, the third is around globalization that um, I hope we are still going to continue with globalization. We're not just going to fragment into, um, you know, into nations and our nation approach. Um, there, you know, one huge player is China. Um, and my wife is Chinese, so I know quite a bit about what's happening in China. And there is a big push by the Chinese government, interestingly, away from didactic teaching towards more knowledge-based education. Just in the last few weeks, um, there has been a huge push and away from uh, these kind of uh, uh, tutorial grind mills for uh, cramming students for exams. The government's recognizing that this is um, 
both is not successful, but it's also hugely stressful for parents and students. And so they're trying to set up a new kind of education in China around more knowledge-based education and more innovative pedagogy. So China's trying to do that. So I think there are huge global opportunities and global shifts. It's a bit like a sort of tectonic shift in pedagogy towards more um, collaborative uh, and towards more uh, conversational and towards more inquiry-based and towards more group-based learning. Um, so I think there will be these tectonic shifts in learning. I, I hope so. And I hope we're still going to see um, this global interaction, people learning from each other. That, you know, going back to that secret power of brands, it was just fascinating having those discussions with somebody from Japan, somebody from India about what brands excited them, what brands meant to them. Um, and I hope we can still have those global discussions um, and those global interactions. So I think enterprises, platforms that can support those sorts of global interactions, as we're doing now, um, are part of the future for education. We'll end with that comment. I'm sorry to, to Sanjay, we won't ask the question about developing the be developing world, but we'll connect you. Because I think <laughs> Sanjay, who is from the Commonwealth of Learning, uh, who is on an early show of Silver Lining, and, and you, Mike, who is on the latest show of Silver Lining, are both kind of honorary members of Silver Lining. If we all <laughs> wanted to take a vacation sometime, we can entrust you with running the show for us. Uh, <laughs> you know, you've known the history. I mean, really, you know uh, the ins and outs and wh where we're headed. So I really, it's been a privilege, uh, and we'll knight you <laughs> as an honorary member of Silver Lining for Learning. And, uh, and, and, yeah. and Please uh, come back some after you, you know, your next impactful uh, project, we'll invite you back. Um, Chris is going to introduce the next show for us. And I, I want to thank uh, Norit and Sanjaya and John and everyone in, in the YouTube channel. Yes, well, Mike, thank you for, for sharing your insights. Uh, our brand, Silver Lining for Learning, every five or six weeks, we have a host reflect episode that is coming up next week uh, and we'll be reflecting on recent episodes not only with Mike's insights but self-directed learning, play, creativity, but also we're going to have a very special guest, Professor Scott McLeod, one of the original founders of Silver Lining for Learning. And if you look up Scott on the internet right now, everything that's said about him will be wrong because he is no longer an associate professor. He is a full professor. So we'll be asking him for his forecasts and insights about the future of learning. Hope you'll join us next week, 5.30 p.m., July 10th.